everyone, Georgie here with Ukraine Matters. I'm glad to be back with you with the year 2024. And we're going to start today's video talking about the situation on the front lines. I know right now there is a lot of uh, meta discussions about the situation in Ukraine with regards to funding, blocking of Ukrainian borders, support from the West. And all of those questions are very important. We're going to talk about those in some kind of future videos. But today I want to specifically focus on the front lines. What's the situation on the front lines? What we can expect happening in the near future? What's the potential uh, outcome? and what are the positive and negative uh, possibilities that can influence the situation on the front line. So we kind of draw the baseline, what is the expectations for 2024 and what we should be on the lookout going forward. But to start, I want to share with you probably the best news that we had in half a year is that Russia has finally been able to be convinced to uh, commit to exchange of the prisoners of war, which is extremely important, and over 200 uh, prisoners of war have returned to Ukraine, uh, which is amazing news. And the most interesting thing about this is not just the families and the people are now safe and back to the independent and uh, strong Ukraine, is that they did not know about this. Some of the people on this photo have been taken capture uh, during the siege of Mariupol. Some of them were captured during the initial siege of the Snake Island. Remember with the Russian warship, go F yourself meme that is the timeline that these people were in a russian prison this these uh, people were also subject to a russian propaganda we know that because there have been other stories i believe rick the ukrainian sometimes does the translations you should check out his channel maybe you can find some information there but uh, these people were taught stories that ukraine doesn't exist anymore that right now ukraine is barely holding on that it's a full subject to russia and that's what they thought. So now that they finally got the ability to be exchanged, they come back to Ukraine, which is far removed from the pictures that Russian propaganda was drawing for them. It's the picture that Ukraine right now has already liberated over 50% of what was initially captured by Russia, that Ukraine has uh, received advanced weapons systems from the Western powers, that it keeps getting support from the Western powers. And it's a whole topic. We're going to come back to this in uh, later videos. But the point is, Ukraine is getting stronger. Ukraine is about to get F-16s next year. It's a far cry from what they were told and what we're still being told on our own from the Russian or the pro-Russian news sources. So I want you to take a look, look at these guys and kind of picture yourself in their perspective and have this snippet of what was Ukraine like when these guys disappeared and where Ukraine is now to kind of put a perspective of where we are in this war and how actually far Ukraine ha has gotten in defense of its lands. I just think it's a good position to start off with. And continuing that position, we're going to start talking about the Kherson front line, more specifically the Krinky bridgehead that Ukraine has on the left bank of Dnipro. In this bridgehead, we saw Russia try to dislodge this bridgehead that Ukraine has around Krynki. Ukrainians were also trying to expand it, but did, didn't succeed. After that, Russia has used, first and foremost, a lot of forces to try to dislodge Ukrainians, but they failed, mostly because of Ukrainian support from the right bank with the artillery strikes and from the massive drone operations that Ukraine is using in the area. After that, Russia transitioned to use more of the aerial strike capabilities, trying to use bombs. But since then, we know that Ukraine has deployed additional anti-air assets, such as the Patriot uh, system, and were able to shut down some of that uh, air force that Russia has been using. This brings us to a situation for 2024 and the possibilities. Krinky Bridgehead is really nice. Uh, I explained many times here that the goal of Ukrainians is to remove Russian artillery, remove Russian air superiority from the area, and hopefully 
try to have Ukrainian superiority in the area in order to push the artillery and everything else that can sure, uh, shoot pretty far way beyond the line that they would be able to efficiently target any kind of crossing over Dnipro that Ukraine will establish like a long-term crossing, maybe a pontoon bridge or restoration of the bridges uh, around Antonovka and so on. So something like that. Uh, the issue with that being is that it requires a lot of resources. So here we talk about the possibilities of 2024. The Krinky Bridgehead is a great opportunity for Ukraine. They indeed can put a lot of uh, additional distraction on the Russians from this area if they're able to establish ma massive like uh, important crossing of Dnipro they could be able to get a significant amount of resources across it could be a really big problem for Russians if Ukraine is able to do so the issue with that is that this st strategy relies on the superiority of Ukrainian artillery uh, F-16s will be a great help, specifically in this area, because they will able to deny additional air power, air surveillance, and so on. And they will able to establish some kind of relative, uh, relatively small zone compared to the other front line, but the control of the area. And it would allow Ukraine to then expand that bridgehead and maybe push Russians out. Most importantly, this is going to be the pos positive or negative outcome of this scenario will be based on whether Ukraine will receive additional ammunition. Uh, specifically, the interest is uh, what, how much and what kind of equipment the F-16s will come with. Right now, we hear some positive news that the new F-16s will come with advanced radar systems, that the, there's supposedly already talks about advanced anti-air uh, missiles to be also delivered with the F-16s. But until I see this in action, I'm not ready to say that Ukraine has those capabilities. If Ukraine is not able to get that air capabilities and if they, we go on from a scenario, where, example, that Ukraine doesn't get additional ammunition, then potentially Ukraine can continue grinding this on through 2025. But sustaining this bridgehead for Ukraine is unfortunately a little bit costly. There's a lot of very good people and like very highly trained people that need to be engaged in this specific task because it's a, it's a very, very important mission and it requires more knowledge than just a basic training we will be looking to see how ukraine and support for ukraine will be expressed in deliveries to ukraine if deliveries of to ukraine will be confirmed for example us uh, will find an agreement on a 60 billion dollar package again we're going to talk in the other videos about this but we will see specifically this area benefit from that probably the most which is a great opportunity for ukraine now, around the area of Robotina, Ukraine, despite all of the, all of the negative rumors uh, that uh, Western media and a lot of the doomers are stating about, oh, Ukraine didn't really get through any kind of Russian defensive lines, this Robotina salient is extremely unpleasant for Russians. It is quite, quite bad because it penetrated Russian defense lines it penetrated the Russian minefields and because Ukraine is keeping up with the intensity of fire, this area is not being reported a lot, but actually there is a lot of back and forth going on here in between Ukraine and Russia. Ukrainians are also counterattacking here a lot. But the fact that the activity in the area is continuing to be significantly high, Russia cannot really build up these massive fortifications and minefields. Ukraine has learned on this and supposedly they are working. Additionally, General Zeluzhny said that they have been doing the work uh, to see how to overcome Russian defensive positions for 2024. So in this area, if, the, again, we're going to be dependent on uh, supplies for Ukraine because if there is no supplies from US, most likely Ukraine will take the whole 2024 to um, accumulate resources and most likely it's going to be in a defensive posture rather than offensive one. However, if the supplies from US will continue flowing, if there is going to be a support both from US and the European uh, allies, 
then we might see a renewed offensive in this direction from the Ukrainian side. And especially, especially if this is combined together with some kind of successful actions around the Kherson direction, if this will be combined with learnings that General Zaluzhny has been saying that Ukraine has did, then in that case, it will be, you could say, a test in, in possibilities to believe in Ukraine again, right? Right now, there's a lot of negativity, whether Ukraine can do things, can they do the offensive and so on, or, or, or they can't. General Zaluzhny says that they have learned, okay, now the question is whether Ukraine will be allowed to have a round two in 2024 to try to go on the offensive. This is what the delivery question is like. Some people are assuming that if deliveries are not met, that means that Ukraine is going to collapse, Russia is going to win. Uh, I feel that this is a false narrative because there is still a lot of support to Ukraine from the European allies. Ukraine is increasing its production output as well. While this is not going to be beneficial because Russia is also trying to grow their production, in general, I don't really see how Russia can overcome everything that Ukraine is being supplied for. They just do not have the massive resources that they need. Therefore, in the area of Robotina, what we should look out for is twofold. Right now, Ukraine is experiencing a little bit of shortage. So the goal of Ukraine for right now in these coming months is to hold the line. They need to be in defense. I know that they're doing counterattacks and I said that they're doing counterattacks. However, those counterattacks usually comes after Russians are doing something and, and basically it's movements in the great area and Ukraine, uh, there are certain positions that Ukraine sees as more beneficial other positions are less beneficial and less beneficial is the gray zone areas where there, whereas all of the beneficial positions right now as i'm hearing on robotina axis while difficult are still being held for ukraine so we should be on the lookout how this situation will develop then the situation around marinka uh, situation around marinka is is kind of twofold um as i explained Marinka by itself, the Russians a couple of weeks ago has said that they've captured Marinka, which is uh, uh, okay, fine, whatever, because the village doesn't exist anymore. It, it doesn't really matter. What I explained to you back then is I said that the fact that the village ends is somewhat irrelevant because Ukrainians were still preparing for the fact that at some point Russians might capture Marinka. There are additional lines of defenses that have been built up for Ukraine. Ukrainians are not stupid. They have been preparing that Marinka at some point could fall. What I was telling you after that, even if Russians take Marinka, it doesn't mean that there's sudden penetration of the front line, that Russia suddenly advances somewhere majorly, collapses this front line. That is not gonna happen. That is not happening. So right now the only difference is that there is no named village where where kind of the activity is happening i guess novo mikhailivka is is kind of a new marinka because russia did gain a little bit of a this northern flank overhanging the the village so it's now a little bit of a pocket here uh, potentially ukrainians will have to fall back to paraskovivka which is right over here but what we need to see is the tempo of Russians here is extremely slow. Ukrainians have prepared positions in this area. They are in defense, but the Russians are not advancing nearly as fast or uh, as much as they want to. Absolutely similar situation is around Avdiivka. Uh, there was some discussion in the expert community that potentially Avdiivka could be abandoned before the New Year's. I was a little bit skeptical about those, like while I'm not a military expert, I've seen the patterns of the Ukrainian armed forces operate and I believe that, that Ukrainian armed forces are operating based on the strong points of defense, of uh, certain defense points. And I don't really see Avdiivka right now being in danger. I explained many times that there are a couple of strong points that first needs to be captured before Avdiivka needs to be basically abandoned. First one is Stepove, second one is the chemical plant, Severne village uh, is the third one, and Lastochkina is a fourth one. So if, uh, let's say, two of four 
or or maybe Tonyan K. It's uh, you can add that technically as well, but I would say it's like this this part together. So if two of these four are out points, then uh, I would say that Ukrainians should really start to consider at what point they need to kind of consolidate, uh, prepare for moving out, prepare the logistics, and then slowly retreat and abandon Avdiivka strong point. Because at that moment, staying in that stronghold uh, is not something that uh, Ukraine should do. Uh, but at this point, these four points are still standing. Situation in Stepove is kind of hard, and I'm getting the reports right now, but we're also seeing longer and longer pauses in between Russian attacks. Moreover, the reports are that the quantity of units that uh, and, and the composition of the attacking groups has changed a lot, and now the attacking unit size is a lot smaller, going back to some kind of a more of Wagner tactics, attacking with 8 to 10 units, uh, 8 to 10 personnel, instead of having like, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 man waves. Uh, this is a Bakhmut syndrome. And again, I'm not completely sure that this will work for Russia. Losses here in Avdiivka are already much worse for Russians than in Bakhmut. It's much worse than it was during their failed offensive uh, last winter around Vuhledar. Avdivka has been like for any other army in the world, Avdivka assault would already be a complete disaster, and the personnel would just need like the heads of the army would already need to be stepped down. But because Russia is beyond that, they dare just continue on. And I don't know whether Avdivka is possible to be held because you know, if you're okay just grinding down your, your resources and just continue on. Potentially, Ukraine will run out of resources. Right now, there is a little bit of shortage. And in this situation, I'm also not completely sure whether additional support from the Western allies, from the U US and so on, would be would allow Avdiivka to be held. Potentially, it's just worth to dedicate the resources that just are necessary for Avdiivka to be held and then just retreat, therefore giving Russia this victory but preserving majority of troops, preserving resources, and then utilizing the resources that they received from U U US and uh, other allies, maybe to attack somewhere else. In all sense, my view of Avdiivka is that at some point in the coming months, if two of these points will fall, then I'm expecting Ukrainians to withdraw from Avdiivka, what I don't expect is that Avdiivka will suddenly become a breach situation, that Russians suddenly just close the pocket, that it's some kind of a new Azov style, and we see Ukrainians encircled. That's just not happening. Not the tempo. All the Russian military is, is grinding down here, and they, they, they cannot really do stuff like that. It's, it's a little bit silly. So around Bakhmut, uh, the situation is, uh, again... Here, Russians are trying to counterattack, and the main point of interest here is the hills which are kind of north of Klishivka. Russia was able to come back and take certain foothold in this area, whereas Ukrainians are obviously trying to hold on to this. And this is the main point of, of the interest, because if Russians are able to, to gain more foothold around these hills, then pretty much Ukrainian counteroffensive around Bakhmut would be a failure. Again, it doesn't help Russians at all. Something that I said around the siege of Bakhmut is still true. Uh, right now, Russian interest in the area of Bakhmut is trying to get towards the city of Slovyansk and Kramatorsk. These are the strong points of Donbass. If Russia's aim is to take Donbass in the area, they need to take Slovyansk. Kramatorsk is like a big city uh, set up over there. I think if I switch to the, if I switch to um, satellite map, you can uh, kind of see it a little bit better. Like if you will see there we go, yes. You can see that it's a big urban area around Slovyansk and it's a big urban area around Kramatorsk with a little bit of like a kind of connecting road. So it's um, a lot, it's like a fortress. And it's a fortress that is many, 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 many times more difficult for Russians to assault uh, than Bakhmut. And more importantly, because it is a little bit of an uphill, 
So from Bakhmut towards Slovyansk, Kramatorsk, it's all uphill battle. It's not going to be easy for Russians. It's only going to get difficult for them to assault. And these hills that we're talking about uh, around this Klishivka area mostly are in relation to this success around Andreevka that Ukrainians were having because it was on the way to kind of try to semi-encircle and maybe liberate Bakhmut. If Ukrainians are not able to hold these hills, then the only thing that we will see is basically the failure of Ukrainian offensive. It will not, however, uh, bring any major tactical advantage for Russians. Nothing major else is going to be threatened besides that. In the area around Kremina, here uh, Russians are really trying to go towards Torsky. They have the salient that they have been holding, but the problem of the salient is still persistent. Uh, the the issue of this salient is is that in this area right over here, like if I take this square over here, here are certain villages around the uh, the river, and there is a supply road over here. Uh, and this area over here, this red square, is basically fields that can be seen as from one side and as from the other side. It's a death field. It's a field that to cross, I know it's colored red, technically, but Russians are not really moving freely through it. So you can see this as a death zone, basically. Whatever so far has been stepping into that death zone from the Russian side, mostly has been obliterated and only like fraction of it was ever able to kind of reach towards Torske, Yampolev, Katerny uh, defense lines. But the same problem still stands for Ukraine. They cannot counterattack. They cannot go through these fields. And right now, Ukraine here is in a strong defensive positions. And finally, to wrap it all up, the situation around Sinkivka stronghold. Ukraine has invested a lot to fortify Sinkivka stronghold. I explained many times that Russia just cannot go around it, like they cannot just push it here because of unfavorable conditions, uh, unfavorable geography, and Sinkivka stronghold basically defends this whole area. It's, it's denying any kind of possibility of advancement. Russia has been throwing quite massive forces in this area, just recently, I was uh, I was kind of looking through what kind of units have been engaged in this area, and uh, those are some like highly named units, like the First Guards Tank Army, and supposedly like some of the elite forces over here. But the results that they're getting, if we're talking about Avdivka or Marinka, where Russia may be like a hundred meters per week, but they're getting somewhere. In Sinkivka, they are getting jack shit. They are not advancing one meter at all. And the losses from this area are impressive. Sinkivka is also the area where we know for sure Ukrainians are creating, um, not, not like Suraviki line, but they're creating significant fortification walls. They're creating like a, a concrete uh, pavements for the machine gun positions. They're creating deeper trenches that are uh, defended against other things. Sivkivka is a massive stronghold. And right now, it's not clear whether Russia even has the power to break it. All of the Russian efforts so far have been absolutely in vain. So I see Sinkivka maybe be as strong, if not stronger, as Marinka. Remember, it took Russia over one and a half year of full-scale invasion to try to grind down Marinka. But again, Sinkivka in the same situation as Marinka, that even if Sinkivka is taken, which it's not, it's far from that, they're going to be line after line after defensive line of uh, additionally fortified positions. And it's going to be a nightmare to try for a nightmare for Russians to try to attack in this area. All in all, we see that Ukraine is is really digging in. Ukraine is preparing for the potential negative impact of not enough support for Ukraine. They are preparing to get through this maybe year, maybe two years uh, of of uh, poor support to their efforts. And they're digging in. They're building up their production facilities. We hear that the plan for this year is to 
uh, increase the production output or in major um, industry areas up to six times. That's the goal. So huge investments of Ukrainian um, Ukraine are expecting in defense structures. Uh, as I explained, the analysts are saying that it's going to be about maybe two years for Ukraine to get that production going. So all in all, I would not yet write off Ukraine and say, wow, mm, you know, Ukraine is done without the US help. That is not true. That is not what's happening on the front lines. Ukrainians are getting prepared for long war to come. And for people that think it's like, oh, well, well Ukrainians, you know, they should just uh, trade the land for peace. That is not working. Russia did not came here for peace. They came here to exterminate Ukraine. And whatever Russia is offering is complete nonsense. And it only works if you want to believe that. But living in a delusional world is your choice, not Ukrainians. Ukrainians know exactly what they're facing. With that said, thank you so much for watching, guys. I love you all. More videos to come quite soon. Slava Ukraini. And I'll see you next time.